Thank you, Chancellor. President Napolitano. Thank you. I guess I got the corner here. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman McCarty, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to engage in an important discussion about the future of higher education in the state of California, and in particular, the challenges and opportunities for the University of California in 2015-16 and beyond. I'm particularly pleased to be joined by my counterparts at Cal State University and California and the California Community Colleges. The visionary approach set forth in the California Master Plan for Higher Education has helped create a dynamic California where educational access, innovation, and upward social mobility are core values. The plan has served the state well, and the three of us spend considerable time working together to ensure that we continue to meet its goals. I'd like to begin today with a summary of the University of California's impact on the state and overview of the current fiscal situation for UC and a short discussion of the UC's goals for the coming years. But beginning with our impact on California, as a catalyst for social mobility, UC has transformed the lives of generations of high-achieving, hard-working students. Through the state's investment, UC has been able to provide the highest quality education to all who qualify, regardless of their social background or economic circumstances. The impact of the university can be demonstrated in a few key facts. UC promotes social mobility. 42% of our undergraduates are Pell Grant recipients, which means that their families typically make less than $50,000 per year. 41% of our undergraduates are first-generation college students. And within five years of graduating, UC's Pell Grant students earn more than their parents' combined earnings. Another impact, UC benefits California's economy. UC annually generates about $46.3 billion in direct economic activity in California. Every dollar a California taxpayer invests in UC results in $9.80 in gross state product and $13.80 in overall economic output. UC researchers produced more than 1,700 inventions last year, an average of five a day. UC trains nearly half of the medical students and medical residents in California. And to date, more than 700 startups have been founded on UC patents, and some 600 of those are based here in California. Next, UC graduation rates are very high. Four-year freshman graduation rates have increased 17 points over the past 12 years to 63%, and the six-year freshman graduation rate is 83%. And UC student debt loads are comparably low. Thanks to Pell Grants, Cal Grants, and UC's Return to Aid programs, 45% of UC undergraduates graduate with no debt at all. And for those who must borrow, the average student loan debt is about $20,000, significantly lower than the average debt of around $26,000 for students at other public universities and $31,000 for those at private institutions. And finally, UC tops many global and national rankings. But the Washington Monthly College Survey is one that makes us especially proud. That magazine evaluates institutions based on indicators such as social mobility, access to research, and commitment to public service. Four of the top five on the list are UC campuses. So while it is my hope that the discussions today are about the future for public higher education, I think it important to outline a few historical points that help underscore where we are today. Due to shifting state priorities over the years and the recent recession, the funding made available to UC has fallen precipitously. As you may know, state support per UC student was $18,040 in 1990. And by 2012, that number was down to $7,090. Put another way, California is funded by the state 
in non-inflation adjusted dollars at the same level it was in 1997. Yet today we educate 75,000 more students than we did in 1997. That's the statistical equivalent of adding an additional UCLA and a UC Berkeley with the same level of funding. UC responded to these cuts over the years by reducing staff, curtailing faculty recruitment, maximizing operational efficiencies, boosting fundraising, and deferring critical maintenance. And yes, university officials raise tuition, sometimes by a lot. Today, students and their families actually pay more than the state does for the cost of their education. And while these tuition increases were not popular, they did allow us to maintain a high level of quality and to continue to provide access to all qualified California students. And while students and families do pay more today than they have in years past, it is wrong to assume that that's because overall educational costs have increased. In fact, we spend much less to educate students today than we did 20 years ago. In 1990-91, UC spent $23,050 per student, and in 2014-15, we estimate that amount to be $18,060. Part of this is because we have taken significant steps to control our costs. To date, we've achieved more than $660 million in savings and new revenues through our Working Smarter initiative. And we are committed to doing more on long-term costs. A key component of these cost-saving efforts has been the reform of our pension system. And if UC were to get equitable treatment from the state for our pension obligations so that the total employer contribution doesn't come out of our core base budget, it would indeed help our fiscal situation considerably. I know this is, interest, uh, this is of an interest to the Assembly as referenced in the earlier vote, and we look forward to working with you on this important issue. However, cost-saving efforts alone will not be enough for UC over the long term. And it was this realization that led the Board of Regents to approve a long-term stability and financial aid plan, which, as you know, includes the potential increase in tuition of up to 5% per year for the next five years. The decision was not made lightly, and the Regents understood that it would not be popular with the governor, with members of the legislature, and with our existing and perhaps future students. However, the plan was put forward because it is essential to be honest about what is needed to enroll more California students and reinvest in ways that directly impact students, such as increasing student support services and hiring additional faculty to expand course selections. Increased enrollment is, in my view, of paramount concern. As you know, the governor's proposed budget increase of $119.5 million does not even fund our mandatory minimum costs and increases and certainly doesn't fund increased California enrollment. The Department of Finance and the LAO believe this is the right approach for California based on their calculations for future demand. I respectfully disagree. First, the Department of Finance projections historically undercount future demand. Second, applications by California students to UC have grown this year for the 11th consecutive year. Latinos are the largest ethnic group among our applicants, and applications from Latinos are growing faster than for any other group. Additionally, increased funding for the Community College's Student Success Initiative, as Bryce just described, and our own work to tr streamline the transfer function are likely to create a surge in transfer demand. We need the capacity to welcome these students, and the Regents Plan builds in this capacity. We also appreciate the thoughtful proposals from both the Assembly and the Senate to provide additional resources for UC and to expand enrollment growth. I agree this is the right approach and have confidence that negotiations in this regard will be successful. However, unfortunately, 
Our campuses need to make decisions on enrollment right now. And we know that the governor and the legislature will not resolve this disagreement on enrollment growth until the end of June. Absent additional funding, UC is not in the financial position to absorb more California students beyond those we currently serve. As such, campuses have been instructed to keep their enrollment of California students flat, meaning that we are not in a position to add additional California resident students for whom there is no additional California state support. We will do all we can to mitigate this decision through wait lists and deferred enrollment, and we will work to make up any shortfall of new California students upon receiving increased funding for future years. I also appreciate the concern about the level of non-resident student enrollment. As you know, non-resident enrollment and the tuition, additional tuition these students pay allows us to enroll more in-state students. However, we will put a cap on next year's out-of-state enrollment at UCLA and Berkeley, where the demand is highest at this year's current level. And we will postpone any tuition increase uh, so that tuition will not increase for the summer term, so that budget negotiations can proceed. While increased California enrollment is the key issue, I hope we will keep the following issues also at the forefront. First, <laughs> students and their families have a right to know up front what the total cost of a UC education could be and how much financial aid they can expect. We need a plan that incorporates stability in funding from year to year. Second, we must reinvest in academic quality to ensure that future students receive the same quality education as their predecessors. We need to reduce the student-faculty ratio, increase course selections, and lessen the time to graduation. Third, UC should maintain its robust financial aid program, which is, in fact, the strongest in the nation. And finally, UC should continue to pursue rigorous cost-saving strategies. You know, the state has weathered some difficult budget times in recent years, and thanks to leadership by the governor and this legislature, we are back on the right track. I am here today to ask that the state now reinvest in our public higher education system. And I feel confident that we can work together to reach a resolution. And please, make no mistake, California is now competing with other states where higher education is concerned. Michigan and New York are making major plans to reinvest in higher education. And the new governor of Texas has made restoring Texas universities to prominence a key component of his economic development platform. In fact, he recently announced his vision to move five of Texas's research universities into the top ten in national rankings, including a proposal to use up to $250 million to recruit nationally recognized faculty and researchers, including faculty at the University of California. Thanks to the vision of the Master Plan and UC's partnership with the state, we have a history of excellence in education and innovation and social mobility in California. Other states are working to catch up, and we need to collectively come together to ensure that we don't fall behind. With that, I look forward to answering the subcommittee's questions. Thank you. Uh, before we get to members of, of the committee, I wanted to introduce as well as a guest today, Assemblymember Cheryl Brown. In the, in the front row. Did you want to join us and, and ask any questions? It's an informational hearing, or you can certainly sit there and listen from the front row. Uh, well, she's joining us. Okay. So with that, we will now uh, start from questions from committee members. I'll have a few, but I'll defer to, to members of the committee. Start with Mr. Ting. Sure. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, President and chancellors, very much appreciate you all being here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a UC grad. I, I used to work at uh, San Francisco State, and of course, I have the largest community college um, in the state in my district. And so, this is this topic is absolutely near and dear to my heart, and it's clearly um, 
I think we're, I think we're all in agreement that we want to keep investing in higher ed and keep reinvesting, and we want to continue to um, shore up the shore up the funding. Um, one one issue I think that we continue to struggle with because we we generally get the requests from the the revenue side of the uh, of of the institutions. What we don't see as much on is on the expense side, and in particular the uh, breakdown of expenses. We've we've asked, and I, I think we're making progress on how to get at what your what your true costs are to educate the students going through each of your systems. Can you give us a sense on how you're making progress on that? I know that's been sort of an ongoing uh, discussion item between the legislature and each of your institutions. Well, I'll begin. Uh, I think we've made um, uh, a lot of progress there. There's a lot of data out there. I mean, we file uh, every year, and it's available, a 140-page accountability report just to start. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, part of the efforts have been to try to provide data in the format or in the categories uh, that have been requested. It's particularly difficult for us because uh, we don't separate into tidy boxes, research and teaching. Uh, they're often conflated. Um, we, we have students who are STEM majors. We have students who switch majors. We have students who are double majors, STEM and non-STEM. So uh, disaggregating information in a different way uh, has been time-consuming and indeed expensive. But I think together the staffs are working through that. 